I'm Dom Nichols, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we get an update from Roland Oliphant, who has just returned from Ukraine, and hear from Tony Diver, our US editor, on how military support for Kyiv is unlikely to be affected by a potential US government shutdown. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. We need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield, to win the war. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday, we sit down with leading journalists from The Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Monday, the 25th of September, one year and 213 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today, I'm joined by our senior foreign correspondent, Roland Oliphant, just back from Ukraine, and Tony Diver, our US editor. I started by giving the latest updates from the front lines. Overnight, there have been Russian drone and missile strikes on Odessa. It's destroyed grain stores down on the Black Sea port. This is coming out of Ukrainian authorities. Southern Defence Forces said that they had been hit by 19 Shahid drones, two Onyx supersonic missiles and 12 calibre missiles uh, aimed at the city. The port infrastructure has sustained significant damage in their assessment, while an unspecified number of granaries and a landmark hotel were destroyed. The suggestions are... Well, they were saying anyone who's been to Odessa, I have not, Roland, I think you, you probably have, you'll know better than me. The Landmark Hotel, which, which everyone will know if you've been to Odessa, you'll know the hotel that sticks out on the front. There's suggestions that, that was been, uh, that's been attacked because of the, uh, the strike on the Black Sea Fleet headquarters in Crimea of more in a moment. But uh, warehouses are, are on fire as a result of falling debris, authorities say there. Now, just to reiterate, you know, this is, we've seen an intensified attack Attacks on a number of Ukraine's ports, including Odessa and Mykolaiv, since the uh, since Russia pulled out of the the grain deal um, back in July. And whilst the casualties seem low, I've only seen a small number of injuries, no no deaths yet reported. But if you look, just look at the images, you'll find it online and uh, on our website. I mean, the, the, these you know the huge buildings destroyed. Just think about the impact on daily life and just having to endure that day after day. So when we say there's no no casualties or low figures, it does not mean it, it doesn't have huge disruption. Now, separately, let's look at the um, the Ukrainian push in the south of the country. I'm kind of loath to call it a counteroffensive because when does that when does a counteroffensive end and just offensive begins or you try to get your country back begin? So I was going to call it the push in the south of the country. ISW, well-respected uh, Institute for the Study of War, US-based think tank, they say they are now prepared to assess that Ukrainian forces have broken through Russian field fortifications west of Vobove in the western edge of Zaporizhia Oblast. Now, these the lines that they say they've got through are not the final defensive line in the whole um, the the sort of network of defense defensive systems there in the area but the ISW is saying that there are a specific series of the best prepared field fortifications that have been punched through there is that they are a near contiguous belt of anti-vehicle ditches dragon's teeth which is the, the, the concrete sort of pyramid structures that will if they're sited correctly not in soft ground and are made of the right stuff and positioned correctly and so on and so forth they can uh, severely impede if not stop armored vehicle movement and of course, the fighting positions that have to cover the lot. There's no point in having these, these, or very little point in having such engineered fortifications if you're not covering them with view and fire. But they're saying that the that they've managed to Ukraine's managed to get through this chunk of the best prepared defence fortifications. We've long been assessing, speculating, discussing whether or not Russia has the personnel to sufficiently populate the, the other defensive lines that there are so there's this idea that it's just it's a hard crust as we saw up in the Kharkiv area last year and if you can punch through that crust then maybe maybe there'd be a more freedom of movement beyond but I think we're we're gonna we're jumping the gun a little bit there we'll hopefully find out in the next few weeks but let's just zoom out for a moment and look at the defense in the area of this salient this bulge that is south pushing south into Russian lines that Ukraine has achieved with this uh, with this offensive since June, the, the, count, the counter-offensive since June. 
We shouldn't get too carried away. Reports are sketchy. Information is very difficult to come by. And even if it's all true, there's still a long way to go. There's still about 12 k's north of Tokmak, that major road and rail junction. And then that itself is still north of Melitopol and the coast of the Sea of Azov. So a long way to go. But let's just have a look where we are. The unit of currency we're going we're gonna, to I'm going to refer to is divisions. So a division, you would generally expect a Western division to number about 10,000 troops. Of course, it all depends on the role of that division, how heavily worn down it is by combat, what its particular mission is on that day. But about 10,000-ish for a Western division. Russian divisions could be similar, but their air assault, the VDV, the airborne forces, are smaller. They're, they're lighter, lighter rolled troops. We think about six to 8,000 in an airborne division so just have, have that in the back of your mind looking at the salient there in the in the south of ukraine we think elements of three russian divisions are actively trying to defend there, push against the ukrainian assault from west to east then so from west to east we think in the west there are elements of russia's 76th air assault division deployed on the western flank so near Kopani, so this is about 10 k south of Orkhiv. If you take Orkhiv as the, as the start point of the counter-offensive, so Kopani is about 10 k southwest and Robotine is about 10 k due south. That's where the 76th Air Assault Division seems to be defending. So if, if you take Orkhiv as, as the centre of a clock, we're now talking sort of 7 o'clock down to 6 o'clock. And that little lozenge there, and yes, I am waving my arms across the desk as I'm saying this. So then... In the centre, you've got elements of the Russian 42nd Motorised Rifle Division. So th that is not an airborne division. We think that probably has got about 10,000 troops. It would have 10,000 troops on the February 24th last year. It may not have now. And if it has got those numbers, it's probably largely conscript. So you've got to take everything. It's not just a numbers game. You've got to take everything with a pinch of salt and assess quite how trained and capable they are. But we think they're defending the southernmost point of the Ukrainian penetration and they are in the area of um, Novoprokopivka, so that's about 15 k south Orkhiv, so on the clock, 6 o'clock through to 5. And then over to the east, we've got uh, more air assault, more airborne forces. So the 7th Air Assault Division seems to be covering that eastern flank near a sort of line from Vobove to Novoprokovka. Um, that's from Vobove to the west. And this is five o'clock through to three-ish, if you like, sort of half three, that kind of salient. Now, over the weekend, a Russian airborne forces affiliated source said that Ukrainian forces had entered for Bove for the first time. That was on Friday and they continued pushing east. These views are contested by others, but a source that is cited by George Barras, who's the geoint, as in geographic intelligence, a team leader and a Russia analyst at ISW, a source that he rates, suggesting they pushed into Vobovia for the first time on Friday and continued going. And there have been sightings of US donated Bradley infantry fighting vehicles. So as we saw a few weeks ago, Ukraine seemed to go back to the tactic of using very heavy artillery and, and using infantry assaults because the early assaults when they tried to use the western donated kit didn't go too well and we saw those images of, of some leopards and some bradleys and we've seen strikers knocked out as well if they are using western donated kit especially bradley then that that suggests that they are confident in either how to use them or they're confident that the threat is sufficiently neutralized that they can risk them now that same source said ukrainian forces as of yesterday sunday had occupied half of the town of Bove, so the western half. There are signs, if you, if you take it all, if you look at everything that's going on, it, it would suggest that Ukraine is trying to attack into Vobove from the west while also trying to bypass the town to the north. Now, that may be, why would you use a bypass? That may be to attack from a different direction. The aim is always to give your enemy multiple problems to have to deal with it at a time, to overload their planning and staff capacity and then defeat them with heavy metal. So they might be trying to, to flank to the north or the attack from the west could be to fix the Russians that are in Vobove and stop them deploying north to counter those bypassing units. And why go north? Well, the town of Novofedorivka, that's about 5 k's northeast of Vobove, is thought to house the 56th Airborne Regiment, which is part of the 7th Air Assault Division. So any bypass that could split that line and split the 56th Regiment away from, from its sister units in the rest of the division would be, would be significant. I mean, that's, that's difficult. 
if you think a bit from the Ukrainian point of view, if even if you manage to get a wedge in there, you then have the 56th Regiment of Airborne on your left flank and the rest of the 7th Air Assault Division on your right flank. So, you know, it's a, t- a tough call. But if you can split forces up, just as we saw last year, remember the pressure that Ukraine kept on in Bakhmut for months with a huge cost. But because Bakhmut was the, there were so many sort of um, the fault lines between the different units and between Wagner and all the rest of it, it, was, it, it served them strategically. And just look what's happened now, especially to Wagner. Um, you know, look what happens if you apply enough pressure on those fault lines, on those joins between the different units. So that might be what they're trying to do up there. But I'm, I'm verging on speculation there, so I will, I will stop. The last bit now for the news is that Russian authorities are currently in the process of demolishing their Black Sea fleet headquarters in Crimea. This was after, you remember, the um, suspected Storm Shadow slash Scalp cruise missile attack a few days ago. Controlled explosions were expected to be carried out on the site until, well, till midday London time, so just over an hour ago. And that came from the Kremlin installed governor of Sevastopol, Mikhail Razoviev, who we we quoted the other day. He said, it will be loud, so I warn you in advance on Telegram. Yeah. And nothing says your lightning three-day assault on Kiev is going to plan quite like blowing up your own Black Sea Fleet headquarters a year and a half later. But anyway, uh, I'm now delighted to welcome back Ronan Oliphant, senior foreign correspondent for The Telegraph, who's just uh, just spent some time again back in uh, back in Ukraine. Roland, what you, you've written about it recently, so we can all go and find that. And I do do recommend people to point people towards your article. But just give us your overview of, of where you were the last couple of weeks, last few weeks, what you're up to, and your thoughts from this uh, from this latest jaunt. Welcome back, mate. Yes, yeah, so I was back. It was a relatively, by Ukraine deployment standards, fairly brief trip. And um, we were in country for about two weeks. I spoke to you a couple of times during that time. We reported from. First from the south, from the Battle of the Danube, which is basically an air battle. And I, I believe there were most strikes there overnight where the Russians are basically running nightly assaults, nightly drone attacks and missile attacks onto the, the grain exporting infrastructure um, on the Danube River on Ukraine's border with Romania. Uh, that was our first, our first big thing. I spent some time in Kyiv having meetings, catching up with people, getting into stuff. And then we, we, we headed down to Zaporizhia region. We spoke to some soldiers who are involved in the, as you called it, the southern push, the counter-offensive, the offensive, the big push down there. Um, and we that, that was really the objective of the trip, was to get in there and really talk to the guys who, um, you know, not, not generals, not analysts, not people who have the privilege like us of, of sitting back and drawing arrows on maps, but the guys who really are the arrows, you know, the guys whose view of the battlefield is from a trench, really understanding w- what it's been like. In that and so on, the, try, trying to paint a picture of the actual nature of the battle down there. So that was essentially our trip. So the south, Zaporizhia, and Kiev. And as I ask you every time when you come back, what, so what would have changed since the last time you were there? It's difficult to, to summarise that. How do, how do I answer that question? This isn't really a change because it's been true, you know, you see it gradually as time has run on, but the, the way people have adapted to the war is very much... Um, I'm trying to avoid the word normal, um, but it, it kind of is normal. So um, if you're traveling around the country, what has, you know, early on there were checkpoints everywhere. There was a lot more nervousness and that slowly, you know, some of the checkpoints disappeared fairly early on because some of them were manned by just volunteers or DIY kind of stuff. That was in the very early days. But, but these days, honestly, I mean, I, you can drive for miles and miles and miles without seeing any real sign of of a war being on things feel life back to the normal routine in many ways if you're away from the front and the main thing you notice is that there's definitely fewer people in the country than there were before roads are relatively quiet cities are quieter than they were in places like Dnipro and Odessa and Kiev are definitely you know they're busy they're, they're busy enough to have proper rush hours and things like that but nonetheless you can you can feel in peace time that there aren't as many people around as there there would have been so there's that, um, a couple of other things. Down in Zaporizhia, in, in the city itself, I took a nice, pleasant evening walk along the riverbank. 
There is a vast expanse of former riverbed which has been exposed by the collapse of the Kakava Dam. So you get to stroll along looking at the exposed geology and the, the you know, this kind of like seabed full of freshwater snail shells and things. And that brings you up close and personal with that big debate about how the, the disappearance of that reservoir is going to affect the entire landscape of and the economy of central Ukraine. There are already debates around how that is going to be dealt with. And the last thing is, I mean... It's probably, I don't know if it's the first time, but I've definitely heard, I don't know, fatigue kind of spilling into in a couple of occasions with people I've spoken to, definitely morale a bit lower than I've encountered it before. Definitely heard a couple of people saying, daring privately to to question the official line about fighting to the end and conquering, reconquering every inch of Ukrainian territory. I mean, I wouldn't say that's a massive shift in public opinion there. It's just I have heard one or two kind of fed up people talking about that in ways that perhaps they haven't in the past. Yeah, I don't think that would be too surprising. I mean, this idea, I note with some degree of humour, I hope, the uh, demolition of the Black Sea Fleet headquarters. But of course, a a lot of war is is not about how hard you can hit, it's how hard you can get hit and still keep going. So the the push in the south, a lot of people have have criticised it for for it should be further, it should be this, it should be that, it should be whatever. And of course, Ukraine said, hey, look, it's our war, We'll, we'll do it the way we want to. And provided the cost to them is acceptable, then they will say that the gains are are worth it. Now, we have very little idea of the cost to Ukraine of that push in the south. Did you get any real any real feel for that in terms of the casualties and, and, and what it's what it's costing them to, to keep going? Because it, it is moving in the direction they would want, but it is slow. We do accept that and necessarily slow, probably because all the, the minefield and defence is down there. But did you have some kind of feel for how long they could keep that going? So the caveat to put at the top of this is that that information is kind of state secret, right? So anyone you talk to can't actually tell you that. And even if I did find it out, I'd be put in a pretty tricky journalistic position because I'd lose my accreditation straight away, things like that. I think readers should be aware of that. So this is is kind of information that the Ukrainian side and the Russian side, to be fair, dealing with their own casualties, really, really concentrate on suppressing that information for various reasons. I think... To be honest, I think casualties have been really high. I don't think there's any way of getting around that. I think you can see that in all kinds of, you know, it shows up in all kinds of places. How long, I have no idea what the size of the reserves are that would allow the Ukrainians to keep on fighting. I mean, the, 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 I visited the 47th Brigade and they were fighting. They were one of the brigades who began the offensive back in June. They were the brigade that went into action on that first day. In fact, if you remember... Um, first day or two of fighting suddenly Russian telegram channels were putting out these videos of blowing up leopard tanks and stuff it was you know they were saying it shows that western tech isn't what it was those were that was the 47th these are the guys who went in they've been fighting non-stop basically for three months they were still there when I was there I didn't get the impression they're going to be there much longer and I don't know who, presumably, there's another corps or another brigade that will, that will come in and, and rotate those guys out. I think, actually, your question is, is one of the big... I don't have a direct answer to it, but it, it, is, it is the big question of this battle. In fact, the big question of the war. It's about these casualties. And although, you know, I've, I've been able to travel around and kind of chat to people and get some sense um, of what I think are losses on the Ukrainian side. I've got no idea what the Russian side is. I suspect it's very, very similar. I think the Russians have been taking very big casualties trying to hold that line. Um, and, 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 you know, the, the grim kind of basic calculus around these battles of attrition um, is who suddenly finds they can't hold the line um, because they haven't got the people to plug the gaps um, and then begins to crumble. I think that's what we're getting to. And I think the Ukrainian strategy at the moment is very much about degrading degrading Russian manpower, degrading Russian logistics to bring them to that point. But the short answer is, I don't think people should be complacent about the costs of the battle, up and down the line and particularly down there. Yeah, this question of of when you rotate troops out of the line of contact is really interesting, i.e. if you are, the longer you're there, the more experience you get, hopefully, and you, you survive and you learn and you adapt and you and you move on. But there comes a time when you're just physically and mentally and emotionally exhausted and you need to be rotated. But of course, generally at that point, you are at your 
or maybe just slightly before that, you're at your most lethal, you're at your most effective because you've been doing it for so long. So as a commander, do you then say, oh, just just leave them in there for another week, another another two weeks, another month because they're, you know, they're doing the stuff, they're, they're making it work. But of course, the longer you leave them there, the, the more chance there is that they'll come off the boil and they'll take casualties or they're just going to be even more exhausted. So do you then rotate them out, put fresher troops in there that take a little while to get going, to get up to speed, to learn the environment, to really get to grips with um, the enemy in their sector? And of course, that that little sort of change of gear might might be all it takes to halt, a, halt the momentum or allow the opposition in. So it's, it's a really, really tricky area. One will be picking up with our guest tomorrow, of which uh, more more later. But for now, Roland, thanks so much. Really appreciate you joining. Do um, I know you've got other stuff on, so don't don't feel you have to hang around if Memphis is cracking the whip. But uh, you're very welcome to uh, stay and offer your final thoughts at the end. But I'd love to now turn to uh, Tony Diver. Very uh, very warm welcome back, to, uh, Tony. Tony's our US editor, so our team's got up early for this. What is it, over there, 8 o'clock, just after 8 o'clock, East Coast? Tony, fascinating to hear what's happening in the US and this idea that USA to Ukraine will continue, even if the government over your side of the pond is forced to shut down next weekend. I think they call it Operation Atlantic Resolve, but love to hear about that. But firstly, as you pointed out to me in the last few minutes, breaking news that the first M1 Abrams, not Abrahams for those in the room, and you know who you are, M1 Abrams tanks have been seen in Ukraine. Tony, what can you tell us about that? Welcome, welcome. Hello. Yes, that's right. Um, that's, that's news has just come in this morning. That's actually quicker than we expected. Those tanks come as part of a huge package of $350 million or so that was announced by Joe Biden last week during his bilateral with Zelensky in D.C. So, But actually, it was, it, it, we knew at that point that they were good, the tanks were going to arrive at some point in the next week. The fact that they've arrived at that summit was on Thursday, and we're now talking on Monday. So that's very quick. I mean, these are the first, it's the first time that these tanks have been in Ukraine, and, and actually, we expected at some point that they would be delivered, but not as quickly as this. So that's good news for the Ukrainians. Less good news for the Ukrainians is that there is an ongoing debate happening in Washington at the moment about support for Ukraine, which is becoming increasingly controversial. And actually, I think all of that was laid bare during Zelensky's visit last week. He came basically sort of with his cap in hand to speak to Republicans and the government here to ask for more support, which is a you know a story that we're well familiar with, having seen Zelensky on the international circuit in the last 18 months or so. But what we did see is sort of new music from Republicans, including those who have previously been supportive of the US's uh, funding of the war, a feeling that actually they feel that the US has already spent enough. Uh, and we even saw Kevin McCarthy, who is the, uh, the speaker in the House of Representatives and therefore the leader of the Republicans there, saying that he wanted more accountability, both from Zelensky and from the federal government on what the money that's already been spent by the US has been spent on and how effective it's been. And McCarthy is someone who's previously been very supportive of sending that aid to Ukraine. So there is a sort of increasing concern, both from Democrats, a fair chunk of Republicans and from the Ukrainians, that the US might be going off the boil a bit here. And given that it is the single largest contributor to to both military, financial and humanitarian aid in the country, that, that is a big risk. So that's sort of we're sort of good news about the tanks and about that package last week, but actually much stormier news about a, an additional funding package for Ukraine, which is what this row is all about, which is another twenty four billion. So actually significantly more money, which is which is now looking a bit at risk. Yeah, fascinating. I mean, Mick McCarthy's, uh, sorry, Kevin McCarthy's comments there about more accountability. What's your reading of the politics here? Because, I mean, yeah, I mean, I want accountability as well. I don't want this stuff just to be, be spent willy nilly and we don't, we don't know where it is and how effective it is. But do you think this is Mr. McCarthy trying to appeal to the, that wing of the Republican Party that are less inclined to support Ukraine, but without coming out and saying that? So is he trying to weave a political line between both stools and sort of have have his muffin and eat it so to speak yeah i think that's exactly what's happening i mean that is his job as the speaker is to try and keep the gop together in the house and try and get them to all vote in a block i mean the republicans have got an incredibly thin majority in the house and so when there is a rebellion from a sort of rump of republicans on an issue like this it's basically his job to try and sort it out so yeah i mean 
you know, as I said before, Kevin McCarthy's previously been very supportive. So I think this is a sort of an attempt to appease those people. Um, and without getting too much into the politics of it, because it is a very DC bubble story, but the wider context here is that there's a much bigger debate going on about government spending and there's a prospect of a government shutdown here which could happen in six days time if the house can't come to some kind of agreement over a short-term funding resolution for the federal government um so actually you know while we're focused on this conversation about ukraine uh that same group of republicans which is rebelling is also holding up a big spending deal that kevin mccarthy would like to get through so at this point he's kind of a peak diplomacy with that group in his party, because if he can't get this sorted out and he can't bring the Republicans together, then there's a very serious chance that he might lose the speakership. So, yeah, I mean, basically, the answer to your question is that's exactly what's happening. And um, when friend and colleague Francis Durnley was interviewing Mitt Romney, uh, what was it, a week and a half ago, Mr. Romney was making the point that for 5% of the US defence budget, one year's defence budget, effectively, and of course it's a team effort, but effectively the Russian land army has been wiped out. Now, still got an air force, missile force, a lot of nuclear weapons, navy and a very capable submarine force. But in terms of threats to the to NATO, let's say, or the Western uh, alliance, knocking out the Russian land army for 5% of one year's defence budget is not a bad return on investment. Why is that argument not being made more strongly or, or not and not breaking through? Or, or is it just, is it wrapped up in the personalities that are making it? Yeah, I think it's a couple of things. The first thing I would say is that uh, inflation has been very persistent here. There is a cost of living crisis. Inflation is not as bad as it is back home in the UK, but it is bad. And so this is in a way a kind of easy populist argument for some Republicans to make because they can say, look at this, these billions and billions that the, the federal government is spending on war in Ukraine. Meanwhile, Americans uh, are feeling poorer. So, I mean, in a way, it's a sort of vote winning strategy for some and the war in ukraine for a lot of americans feels very far away so so perhaps some are sympathetic to that argument so there's that going on but i mean there's also the question of how this is framed in international relations terms and and if you listen to what some of these republicans are saying and the more prominent ones are actually in the republican primary race rather than in congress but people like donald trump Ron DeSantis, Vivek Ramaswamy, these three Republican frontrunners who are all making this argument, they are making what they describe as realist arguments in international relations terms. This, they say, is all about power balancing. And yeah, I mean, you're right, it's quite a strange idea because we're, we're used to thinking about power balancing in international relations as the US and Russia basically squaring off against each other and trying to compete. They're saying, actually, competing in this case is the worst thing you can do because you only inflame tensions further with Russia. You potentially embolden a Russia-Chinese alliance, which could come back to bite America in the future. They're saying the real risk here in the long run is actually about China, not about Russia. And so we need to think a bit more long term. So, yeah, this I, I think this debate is happening at multiple levels. It's happening on a daily spending level and it's happening in the headlines and it's people thinking about the, the dollar in their pocket. Um, that actually there is a slightly wider reframing of the way that the American right thinks about international relations and power balancing. I, I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Now, uh, another thing that's been happening this week over your side is you've had a visit from David Lammy and John Healy. So David Lammy is the Labour Party. So in this country, the shadow, the opposition, the shadow foreign secretary, John Healy, the shadow defence secretary. This is ahead of a, a general election here in the UK that has to happen before January twenty five convention is that it's just it's just madness to try and have a have an election in the winter so we're expecting a um, an election well in in a year's time really so at the moment the polls are in labor's favor so david lammy john healy shadow foreign shadow defense out there working the corridors of those people they may be maybe working alongside in a little over a year's time what can you tell us about their visit who have they been to been to see and what kind of uh, what kind of noises are they making well, I had a very interesting chat with them last week, actually. And yeah, you're right. They were over trying to get around as many people as possible. Um, they met with a couple of more junior defense officials at the Pentagon. And they also met with some some congressional Republicans and, and Democrats as well. I think basically the message is you might have been worried about previous versions of Labour on international relations, foreign policy and defense, but you don't need to worry about us. That's basically what they're trying to convince 
the Americans. And for American listeners who don't know them, David Lammy is a long-standing Labour politician. He's the MP for Tottenham in North London, but he's also got a lot of US connections. He's, he's friends with Barack Obama. He spent every, you know, every year of his life, basically, he spent some time in the US. He's got family over here. He's got actually probably the best uh, American political connections of any member of parliament. So he was basically leading the diplomatic effort. And again, for American listeners, you might not be aware of the kind of recent history of the Labour Party. But until two years ago, Jeremy Corbyn was leader of the Labour Party. And he had what most people regard as some quite dicey views on whether or not NATO itself was a good idea and whether or not Britain should have a nuclear deterrent and, and that sort of thing. So actually, what it seems Healy and Lamy are doing is trying to undo some of that damage and trying to convince the Americans that, that Labour can be trusted on these issues. I think actually one thing I'll just point out there, and I mean, people can go and read that interview for themselves. But one thing I would point out that was interesting, I asked, we're in a re- there's a realistic possibility here that Labour wins the election next year in Britain, Donald Trump wins the election next year here. And then you've got Keir Starmer and Donald Trump sat opposite each other at NATO summits. Donald Trump said that he wants to cut funding for the war in Ukraine and he's less interested in getting involved in what he basically sees as a European war. So what would Labour do? And Lamy says, well, we would work with Donald Trump. We'd have to work with Donald Trump, which in itself is interesting, given their quite different politics. But he says that we would seek to influence a Trump presidency. We would join together with other NATO allies, you know, including those in Eastern Europe and elsewhere, and try and convince the Americans that they have to keep supporting this war, which I thought was very interesting because it basically suggested that there could be some kind of diplomatic axis between European NATO countries and America, which could play out and basically decide what happens to all of that American support. And Britain very much sees itself as leading that. Labour wants to talk about Britain's role as a NATO leader within Europe. So actually, you know, I think that potentially sets up a very interesting diplomatic conflict there at some point next year, although with the caveat that all of this is very much hypothetical and we don't yet know who's going to win the election. Yeah, of course, but it, it is interesting. And we, we know, I think, just in the last week or maybe two the spending in terms of just cash spending, humanitarian aid and military aid for Ukraine, the the U- European countries have just overtaken the US. Now, of course, the US is, is one country and by far and away the biggest donator and gifter and supporter in, in financial terms for Ukraine. But in terms of these blocks, Europe slash EU, if you like, against uh, America, EU has just overtaken that effort. And of course, one big Donald Trump's big mantra was that, that Europe needed to pay more for its own defence. And this might be coming to pass. And it might also be that the, the Europeans seeing what is happening potentially in the US are realising that actually, if the, if long term support is needed for Ukraine, as, as I believe it is, then the EU members and other members in, in Europe who are non EU countries are saying, well, okay, we need to need to get our act together. We need to we need to prepare for a, a, um, a, a less less committed US potentially and get our ducks in a row. So I just wonder as the John Healy, David Lammy you're making these comments in the US and, and obviously what Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, potential you know, new Prime Minister, is saying, what have they also been saying? What Keir Starmer what, what has Keir Starmer also been saying towards Europe? And what came out of the um, the conference in Montreal last week about this new security pact with Brussels? Yeah, I mean, what Labour is saying on this basically is that European countries, including the UK, should be committing their full 2% uh, to the NATO defence budget and that Britain wants to basically be the leader in convincing them to do that within NATO. So I think there's no question that Labour sees itself as a party that's now committed to defence and and committed to Ukraine. Of course, it's true that some of these European countries will try and make up a shortfall in defence spending if the US does indeed stop support altogether or or drastically reduce it. But it will be very difficult for European countries to do that, given all of the domestic economic pressures that all of these countries are facing, and just the sheer size of that US contribution. It's true that the European Union itself has been committing a lot of financial support to Ukraine. And and if you add together all of the different European countries, it is more than the US. But I mean, just in terms of the stockpile of weapons that the US has got, many of which are making their way over to Ukraine now, and that includes the new missiles that were committed to last week. 
and in terms of just the amount of spending power that the American federal government has, it will be very difficult for European countries to make up anything like the amount that's being spent at the moment. And I think that is a big concern for NATO allies and the Ukrainians themselves. Beyond that, looking at the, US, the UK government's approach to Europe under a Labour government. I mean, Keir Starmer is slightly less restrained in terms of what you can say about Brexit than the Tories are. The problem for the Tories is that entering into any sort of deal or agreement with the EU now will upset all the Brexiteers in their own party who think that the purpose of Brexit was basically to sever all ties with Brussels completely and do Britain's own thing. Labour's less restricted by that. There are fewer Brexiteers in the Labour Party. So, what they've proposed is a kind of new European security pact, which would basically be some of the existing EU arrangements for countries that are already in the Union, plus the UK bolted on the side, but with extra cooperation. And they want to cooperate on that and various other things, most of which are fairly mundane, so we won't get into them. But it does look likely that we'll see more kind of diplomatic cooperation between the UK and the EU under a Labour government. And Keir Starmer, you know, even said that, there's no point in diverging from EU rules in a lot of cases and that actually we should just accept EU rules because they're probably quite good anyway, which has inflamed a lot of Brexiteers back over in the UK. So that on security, it, it does look like we might get some additional measures under a Labour government, which may well be good news from a sort of pre- preventing terrorism point of view. On the more broader stuff, it's not really Ukraine related, so we won't really get into it, but it seems that's going to happen there too. Sure. I should just say the one time I I met and interviewed John Healy, I thought he um you know he clearly knows his defence stuff. He's been in he's been in that post for for quite a while. So if he if he if Labour came in then and he was he was still in that position, which you know, there seems no reason why that should change at all, then I don't see any change at all in in Britain's policy towards support uh, for Ukraine. It might just be the sort of the way it's done, but you know, through which mechanisms and what have you. But uh, I don't see any. Any difficulty there? I mean, he, he was a nice chap. The only thing was that he complained about the, the tea I made him was too weak. I had to use two tea bags, but that probably says more about the Telegraph tea bag cash than uh, than my ability to make tea. Anyway, yeah, I, the well, <laughs> he, he said that he said that it was Yorkshire, and I think we were using Twining's English tea. And he said, "Oh, no, you need Yorkshire tea." It's like, God, this, this interview started. And who's in, who's interviewing who here? Anyway, it was, I will I will take that up with him uh, later. Now. Coming towards the end, I'll ask you chaps for your final thoughts in just a moment. But before I go to Roland for his final thoughts, Tony, just on the attackums, you mentioned it there, the Army tactical missile system, long range precision, can have a unitary warhead, which is just one big bag of bang, or can have cluster munitions, essentially two ranges, shorter range of about 180 Ks, longer range of about 300 Ks. There was some suggestion that the Biden administration had shifted and were now going to were going to supply attackums. Last Thursday, Jake Sullivan, the um, National Security Advisor, says that that they had not made that decision, but it might change in the near future. Turns out that near future was Friday, and it seems like the Biden administration has shifted. But then it seemed as if actually what was on offer was the shorter range cluster munition variant. Have you heard anything? Because of course, what Ukraine are asking for is is everything is both natures and all the ranges but have you heard anything on this over the weekend yeah it's quite difficult to decipher what's going on here because it wasn't part of that 350 million dollar package that was announced last week this is kind of an additional thing which has been agreed in principle by the sounds of it between biden and zelensky as to what might happen in future i think that's partly because the us's stock of attack missiles is quite low and so the Americans are a little bit worried that if they give all of them away to Ukraine, then they won't have any to defend themselves. So I think that's partly what's going on in the background. And Jake Sullivan's comments hinted at that. There was, I saw some suggestion around at the weekend that actually what was going on here was the US was going to supply these missiles secretly to Ukraine and then do a big reveal when they were ultimately used to great effect in the war against Russia. And that it was an element of surprise thing, although, of course, it did as all of these things do, immediately get leaked. So the Washington Post, who then broke the story. So it is a bit difficult to decipher what's going on. You're the weapons expert, not me. So I don't know what the real debate is between the cluster version and the long range version of this missile. But it certainly seems that the US is committed to doing it. And perhaps that means that we'll see them make their way over there in the next few weeks. Although perhaps the Biden administration will hold off on that and wait to get this funding deal through before that happens for the kind of domestic reasons that I was talking about earlier. Yeah, I think it came back to the this ongoing nervousness about what is escalatory and and the I think the way that the Ukrainians have used the British French Storm Shadow slash Scalp cruise missile 
just inside inside Ukraine, which obviously includes Crimea, has given a certain amount of confidence to the US that they would not they would not fire into Russia. Whether or not you think it's it's right and they should be able to fire inside Russia using these weapons, that's stand that to one side for a moment. But there's huge nervousness about uh, if that would happen and whether or not it would be escalatory. I think also I've heard that the the project known as the Precision Missile, Precision, what's it called? Precision Standard Missile, which is the replacement for ATACMS. That project is going well. That's due to start coming in from next year, I believe. So the idea that the circa 4,000-ish that we think might be in the US inventory, that the argument sort of goes away a bit that they would wear down their own reserves in case something else happened anywhere. Taiwan! But um, if the Southern Missile comes online, then that sort of allows them to free up some of their other other munitions. The precision missile, that the new one, that's only really got going in the last couple of years because it has, we think Lockheed Martin are very cautious about this. Well, they're, they're not saying, basically. We think it's got a range of about 500 Ks plus. The reason that's important is because under the now defunct Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, uh, ground-based missiles between 500 and 5,000 kilometers were banned. That treaty collapsed in 2019 after numerous Russian violations of it. The US pulled out. So that treaty has gone away. That allows the development of ground-based ballistic missiles of 500 Ks plus, which brings this missile back onto the table, so to speak. And therefore, that project's back on boosters, no pun intended, and it then may allow ATACMS to be gifted to Ukraine. But all that is still in the mix. Tony, thanks so much. Let's start wrapping up. Roland, uh, delighted that you've, you've stayed with us. Any final thoughts? What are you, what are you looking at now that, you're, now that you're back over Blighty Way? A number of things. I mean, I'm doing a very quick and dirty piece about FPV drones shortly, which we can probably talk about later on the podcast. That was a big thing when I was over there. And there's, oh, there's, there's lots, of, lots of stuff, no, no, no end of stuff to, to get into. Um, I suppose my final thought, having listened to all this stuff, you know, all these discussions about Western help... Look, Having come back from where I've come back from and spoken to the people I've spoken to, I think we've got to accept that there is a big gap between kind of the rhetoric and, you know, what things say on paper and and, and discussions of ranges and stuff and what it actually means for guys in the field who are actually having to clear trenches. And I actually think that there are kind of real deficiencies, actually, in some of the assistance that's been, you know, we're talking about how much has actually been delivered, but also talking about the effectiveness of stuff that's been delivered. We're talking about the effectiveness of the training. And I think on certain certain aspects of that, I think NATO, the West, including everybody, actually, including the United States, Britain, other members of the alliance, need to have a, a long, hard look in the mirror. And because there are serious lessons to be learned about the West's own understanding about how to fight these wars and the reality of it. And we can, we can get into that another time but I, I seriously that was one of the impressions I got from the conversations I had with ordinary Ukrainian squad it's as I say like not people who get to sit sit in operations rooms and point offensives in general directions the guys who actually have to take this stuff and go and risk their lives doing really nasty work out there in the tree lines on the seventh front and on that note um, if I may I'd just like to plug once again last Saturday's piece which was our big piece which I hope gave some kind of voice to those guys who I don't really think get enough coverage really the real ordinary privates and lance corporals who are at the sharp end you can still find it online please go and have a read it does raise some of those issues maybe we can chat about that next time cheers it really does. And um, I suggest you sort of retweet that and uh, we can amplify it. I thought it was a fascinating piece. And it also showed the, just the ridiculous, ridiculousness of war. That The guy you were interviewing who said he came face to face or four feet away from a Russian guy. They both fired at each other, both missed and what have you. And then and then he said he had an asthma attack. And then he, he, he reported how he was laughing. I mean, in the middle of this this chaotic life or death situation, he has, a, he has an asthma attack. It's like life intrudes. But yes, please do go and go and have a look at that uh, that piece by Roland. It was fascinating stuff. And we do need to come back to you, Roland, for the FPV drones, the first person view drones. These images you'll see on social media. There's a there's a an incredible piece on social media today. I mean, it is not... When I say incredible, I mean it is not credible because it looks absolutely genuine, but of a, of a drone that was hunting Russian headquarters uh, or field headquarters, found a place, scooted around, went inside the tents, went down into the trenches and then detonated. I mean, it brings back into... We've said before, are drones changing war or are they just a new... Is it just a, a new 
technological expression of an old military ideal. But some of these things, we used to do what's called triple AD in the military, all arms air defence, which was somebody had to be on, on, on stag the whole time looking up, looking for helicopters and and, uh, and planes and what have you, and they go, oh, they're over there. You know, if somebody if somebody came along, but you've now you now look, you nowhere is safe. This headquarters that was uh, that was underground under under camouflage tents, nobody saw a drone hovering around and, and hunting about and also sort of chucked a stick at it as we've seen before to swat it out of the sky or shot it or what have you, and it went in and blew it up. So find that footage on social media. But yes, we do need to get you back, Ron, to talk about first person view drones, FPV drones. Tony, any quick final thoughts, mate? Uh, yeah, that piece sounds fascinating. I'm definitely going to look out for that. I am. Um, yeah, I think my. Only thought, and this kind of links into what to what Roland was saying about the disconnect between the diplomatic conversations about this and the political conversations and what's going on on the ground. I think there is a bit of a risk here, which is that these conversations among Ukraine skeptics, the Republicans, which are not at the moment the mainstream, are not going to go away on their own. And they are making compelling arguments to a lot of Americans about this. And we are approaching an election. So there needs to be some kind of attempt to do something to, to bring these people back if that is indeed what the rest of NATO wants, which it appears that it is. So I, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but it seems that the kind of Ukrainian playbook as far as we've got, which is Zelensky making personal appeals to politicians and visiting their capitals and talking about what's happening on the ground, seems to be wearing a bit thin with some people and perhaps something new, a new case needs to be made for the war by NATO allies as well as by the Ukrainians. I don't know exactly what that looks like, but it does appear that that's where we are. And, and if that doesn't happen, then I, I can't see some of the sentiment, you know, on the on the American right going away. Well, thanks, Tony. And uh, before you, he's had to dash off, but uh, but thanks, Roland. And thank you all for joining. I should say, I very glibly use these phrases, but sorry, first person view drone is the uh, the guys and, and girls we see wearing goggles and driving the drone some kilometres away, actually f- physically steering them onto their target. We've seen them attacking tanks and what have you. And now I suggest we've seen, as I say, we see today driving into a, a bunker compound. So first person view is literally the, the sort of virtual reality goggles and uh, men and women flying the the drones so good so that's a term we're all going to have to get used to as well ukraine the latest is an original podcast from the telegraph to stay on top of all our ukraine news analysis and dispatches from the ground subscribe to the telegraph you can get your first three months for just one pound at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash ukraine the latest or sign up to dispatches our ukraine newsletter which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine Live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so that you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it's released, do refer to podcast apps. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk we do read every message. You can also contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. Ukraine The Latest was today produced by Giles Gear and Elliot Lampitt. Executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.